Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 274 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and I'm joined today by Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. This is an episode that we recorded a few months ago to thank our patrons at patreon.com slash StarQuest for their generosity in making this and all our shows at StarQuest possible. We gave them early exclusive access, but now we're sharing it with you to show you one of the benefits of being a patron. Jimmy, what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking about John Keel and the Ultra Terrestrials, which is not a rock group. Um, We're also going to be talking about role-playing games, the communist infiltration book AA-1025, Memoirs of an Anti-Apostle, whether Muhammad existed, the book Heaven is for Real, why there's a limit on how big humans can get, Pole Shifts, Lost Languages, Andrew Jackson Davis, Graham Hancock, Who the Beloved Disciple in John's Gospel Was, The Execution of Mary Surratt, The Blood of St. Januarius, and more. Excellent. All good questions. So, folks, please enjoy the show. Our first question comes from Teresa Mutafis. She writes, Hi, Jimmy. I've been reading a lot of John Keel, and while his thoughts can't totally be reconciled with a Catholic worldview, I do find some of his ideas about the origin and purpose of so-called ultra-terrestrials makes a lot of sense. At a minimum, it blows the idea of aliens and ETs out of the water. He did extensive research. I've read one criticism of him in his shoddy research, but no examples. His research seems to have been extensive and well done, and he did it all pre-internet. Basically, an episode or 10 on Keel and his theories would be incredible and fascinating. Have you read any of his work, and what are your initial thoughts? Well, I have uh, read some John Keel. He's the author of the famous book, The Mothman Prophecies, which dealt with UFO and other strange phenomenon in a location in the eastern United States. And I plan to cover that in the future, as well as other ideas that uh, Keel has proposed. When you refer to his concept of ultra-terrestrials, and basically the term, for people who may not be familiar with it, is a term he came up with to describe the people he believes are behind UFO and other phenomena, which he believes come from another dimension. So it, it, his, his ultra-terrestrials are essentially interdimensionals. And we will be talking more about the interdimensional hypothesis as an explanation for UFOs and other phenomena in future episodes. I don't know that I have any opinions one way or another uh, regarding the conclusions that he reached. That's something that will develop as I do research for particular episodes. One note that I would uh, mention, though, just as a note of caution, is even if even if Keel is right that some UFO or other phenomena are called by interdimensional visitors, that doesn't rule out the extraterrestrial hypothesis. It could be the case that some phenomena are called by extra are caused by extraterrestrials, some are caused by interdimensionals, and some are caused by other possible parties such as crypto terrestrials, which would refer to another race living in hiding here on Earth, and time travelers from the future. So there are a number of possible explanations for some of these phenomena, but they're not mutually exclusive. And so rather than leaping to the conclusion that they all must be one thing, I think we need to look at individual phenomena and individual cases individually and see what the evidence suggests about them. Our next question comes from Jeremy Nichols, who writes, Can you do episodes on the mystery of ancient pyramid construction among cultures on separated continents, Aztecs and Mayans and Egyptians, the mystery of Alexander the Great's death, Momo, the Missouri cryptid, and maybe a take on the history of humanity slash galactic empire in Isaac Asimov's Foundation series? Thanks for what you do. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, Those are all possible uh, future episodes. In fact, some of them I have I've definitely planned on doing. 
the one that is the hardest fit for Mysterious World, at least in pure form, would be looking at Isaac Asimov's Foundation series and the Galactic Empire that is involved in it. Um, for people who may not be familiar, the Foundation series is based on the idea that it's possible to predict the future of humanity in aggregate. You can't predict what's going to happen to an individual human being. But there's this idea in the Foundation series that uh, someone develops a way to mathematically predict what's likely to happen to large populations of people over long periods of time, like hundreds or thousands of years. And um, that's a, in its pure form, that's a harder fit for Mysterious World because this is a work of fiction. And I don't do reviews and analyses of fiction on this podcast. SQPN has other podcasts that look at fictional and science fictional works. But I might at some point discuss a related concept about how human history unfolds and the degree to which it is or is not predictable and how that would fit with, um, with Asimov's proposal. Uh, frankly, I'm skeptical of Asimov's proposal, but uh, it's something that there are patterns that unfold in history, and it is possible to predict in a limited way what's likely to happen. I don't think over thousands or hundreds of years, uh, but w say within the next century, we can predict things that are likely to happen in that time period. And we will uh, be talking about things like that in the future. And I may mention Asimov's Foundation series. The next question comes from Steely, who writes, Hey, guys, my wife and I love your show. Thank you for all your great work. I was wondering, Jimmy, have you ever played a tabletop RPG like Dungeons and Dragons? Even, and if you have, what's your opinion of the common two axes alignment system, good versus evil and lawful versus chaotic with neutral between as a way to portray morality? Well, I've not only played role playing games, I've played Dungeons and Dragons, uh, more than one version of it, in fact. And I've played many other role playing games. I really haven't in several decades. But when I was in college, I, I and high school and college, I did play a lot of role playing games. I've also designed them. Uh, some of them have some of which have been published. Uh, I was one of the contributing designers, for example, um, on a game published by the company Chaosium called Superworld, which was about superheroes. And so if you look in Superworld books, you'll find my name listed as one of the contributors. I designed some of the superpowers that are used and things like that. Um, I was also recently, uh, during the COVID lockdowns, playing an online version of Superworld with the game's main designer, Steve Perrin. Unfortunately, he passed away while we were playtesting a new version of Superworld, but I understand that what we were working on has been given to Chaosium and they may be publishing it. And I hope they do because Superworld is a fun game. I'm, when it comes to the alignment system that's used in Dungeons and Dragons, for people who are not familiar with it, one axis of the alignment system classifies characters as either good, neutral, or evil. And then there's a second axis that qualifies that as either taking a lawful approach to the basic alignment, a neutral approach to the basic alignment, or a chaotic approach to the alignment. So you can have things like lawful good, chaotic evil, and true neutral in the middle. You also can have, uh, like on the good, on the, in the good category, you can have lawful good, which would mean slavishly following principles that are believed to be by the character to be good. On the opposite end of that, you could have chaotic good, which is like, just do good and it doesn't matter how. And then in the middle, you have neutral good, which would be um, neither slavish rule following nor just chaotic, let's take an intuitive approach and do whatever seems good at the moment. It would be a let's take the principles, but apply them not woodenly and not chaotically, but sensitively to the complexities of a particular situation. I'm not a big fan of the alignment system because it encourages some players to play evil characters. It also could be viewed as a little racist in some situations because some um, some races just get lumped in a category like all orcs are evil. 
you know, and it's like, oh, where's the role for free will here? I would, I, and, and also if you slap a label on someone's alignment system, on someone's alignment, it's going to cause the character to play the character in a way that's less complex and more stereotypical. And they're going to feel the need, oh, my character is true neutral, so I'm going to behave in this strictly categorized way as opposed to having a more realistic character development. So I'm not a huge fan of it, but if you were to classify me on the two-axis alignment system, my alignment would be neutral good. Um, I'm definitely on the side of good, and I definitely believe there are principles that need to be applied, but not in a woodenly literal fashion with no nuance to them. Like, uh, for example, one might say, oh, it's, it's wrong to kill, therefore never kill anybody, even in self-defense. Well, that's an unnuanced version of the don't kill ethic, and I don't have unnuanced versions of ethical principles. I, I take them very carefully and apply them to situations. On the other hand, I, I'm not chaotic. Uh, a chaotic good position on the killing ethic might be, oh, just kill anybody that your intuition says needs to be killed. And it's like, uh, no, we need more than just intuition if you're going to actually take life. So um, I would take principles like the self-defense principle and apply it. And I could envision killing in some situations, not a never kill and not a kill anybody that seems reasonable to kill, but you know, we need to think through the principles in a careful way using critical thinking. And I would interpret that as being a neutral good position. All right. And our next two questions are related. So I'll read them one after the other. The first one comes from Father Jeff Horton, who asks, is AA1025 authentic? Its provenance raises all kinds of red flags for me, but I know that some take it seriously. And I have to admit that there are days it looks legit. And then Jared also asked, I started reading the book AA1025 with the understanding it was supposed to be based on a true story. After reading for a while, I came to the conclusion that there's no way it could be true since someone surely would have been able to trace the individual in the memoirs, given the high profile of the individual. I did a little research, found nothing, got disgusted and stopped reading the book. Is there any chance you've come across this story before and know whether it's true or not? Thank you. Oh, yeah, I've I've come across AA 1025 before. In fact, I have a hard copy of it. It was published by Tan Books in uh, several decades ago. I'm not sure if they still publish it. Um, the book's full title is AA 1025, The Memoirs of an Anti-Apostle. And in the, in the narrative of the story, th there's a, a French nurse who has like a patient come into a hospital after a car crash, and she finds after, and he dies, and she finds this diary on him um, that describes his mission as a communist infiltrator to infiltrate and subvert the Catholic Church. We'll have a link to where you can uh, read AA 1025 online. It's not a very long book, and it is not based on a true story. Um, it carries, now there's all kinds of evidential problems with it. Like, so who is this nurse and what is the hospital? And can we verify the existence of this alleged communist agent and, th and more than that, but lest people be confused, the book actually carries a notice that a lot of people overlook that explicitly says it's a work of fiction. And so um, it's not a real thing. It's not a real story. It's an imaginative tale that was made up by a French writer. And the book acknowledges that. It's not trying to, at least if you read the whole thing, including the notice, it's not trying to be a true story. It's, it's an imaginative work. And we will be doing a look at it in a future episode. All right, then our next question comes from Marie Lamb, who writes, Hi, Jimmy and Dom. I love the show. Was Muhammad a real person? I was surprised to find out that some scholars debate whether he actually existed. Also, what is Islam? Thomas Aquinas and others just thought it was a heresy of Christianity. Is this true? From what I understand, there is much disagreement regarding the origin of Islam. I expect this is highly controversial, and I don't mean to offend. I just would like a rational take on it. Thank you. 
So um, Islam would not be a heresy. The way heresy is defined, it is a post-baptismal rejection of a dogma of the church. And um, even though Muslims do reject various dogmas of the church, they ain't baptized. So they're not Christians. It is a different religion. Um, there is some uh, there is some controversy about the the early events in Islam and some of the things that happened. And is this story about Muhammad true or is it not true? And there is legitimate debate about those things. Um, there's also there are indications that some passages in the Quran may be based on actually on Christian literature that has been rewritten from a Muslim point of view. And those are subjects of legitimate scholarly debate. However, scholars do not debate the existence of Muhammad. That is not a scholarly opinion. I know of no reputable scholar who doubts the existence of Muhammad. Um, <clears throat> I'm aware of an individual named Robert Spencer, who, I, who I've spoken with and was quite friendly with, but, and he wrote a book of questioning Muhammad's existence, but <clears throat> that's Robert Spencer's opinion. He's not a, a scholar of the history of Islam. Um, he's not part of the scholarly community in that way. And I think the reason that uh, competent, you know, serious scholars of Islamic history and history in general don't doubt the existence of Muhammad is in part for some of the same reasons that competent scholars don't doubt the existence of Jesus, because we just have good historical evidence that Jesus existed. Even if you were to set aside everything in the New Testament, we have other ancient references to Jesus. We also can simply deduce Jesus's existence from the early history of Christianity, because what happens in early Christianity, you know, every religion wants to appear as ancient as it can, because in religion, antiquity conveys authority. If this is something that's been around for a long time, it's, it's, it gets more respect than as a religion than it's something that was just newly invented. And so um, Christians admitted, the early Christians admitted, we didn't exist as an organization before the, before the first half of the first century. Um, now they would say, we're the fulfillment of Judaism, and Judaism goes way back, but we're the fulfillment of Judaism, and that fulfillment only began with the birth of Jesus Christ about the year three or two BC. And he didn't begin his ministry until the late AD 20s. He was crucified in AD 33, and the church grew from there. But what you then find, and so Christians admit they don't go back farther than that. But by the mid first century, Christians are all over the place. You know, you look at Paul's letters and, uh, and Luke's book of Acts, and Christians are in multiple places all across the Roman world. They've even made it to the capital of the empire, to Rome itself. And so you just see, and you can document this from other early Christian sources as well, outside of the New Testament, within a hundred years, there are Christians all over the Mediterranean basin. Now, in the ancient world, they didn't have the internet and they didn't have telecommunications. So all spreading of ideas, and very few people could read. So for practical purposes, all spreading of ideas had to be done person to person. You, had to, you needed face-to-face -face contact to spread a religion like this. And that means if you have zero Christians in AD 30 or outside of Judea, you have zero Christians. And then in AD 130, you've got Christians everywhere. That means that there had to be an extensive network of people who conveyed the message. And, of course, early Christians revealed the uh, principal leaders of that network. It was the apostles of Jesus, including, you know, St. Paul. Um, but the thing is, travel in the ancient world was very difficult. It wasn't like getting on a plane today. Now, getting on a plane today and flying somewhere is hard enough. But in the ancient world, travel was very hard, very dangerous, very expensive, especially given the fact there wasn't a lot of money in circulation. And, um, and so that means that this network of people who were evangelizing for Christianity were very motivated. 
And given that, uh, you know, that you've got this organized movement with an evangelistic mission. So how did that movement start and who gave it its evangelistic mission? If you imagine that there was no Jesus, no charismatic founder to start the movement and give it its fundamental direction, it's very hard to see how this would happen, especially in such short a period of time. It's very unlikely a group of men would decide, hey, let's get together and call ourselves apostles and, you know, preach a message of this guy we know never existed and go out and face hardship on behalf of this message and undertake difficult travel and personal risk and even risking our own deaths. That's very unlikely to happen if there was no Jesus. It is much more likely and much more natural to say, okay, this movement is what it appears to be, and it it has the founder it claimed. It has a charismatic founder that lived in the first half of the first century and that gave it its missionary mandate, which they then went and carried out, and that's how it grew so fast. Well, we find something very similar with Islam. Now, Islam is a few centuries later than Christ, but they admit we didn't exist as an organization before the birth of Muhammad in the 500s, And then you watch Islam spread very rapidly within a century. It's taken over vast swaths of territory through military conquest, which is because Muhammad was an Arabian warlord. And he, instead of giving it a strictly missionary mandate, he gave it a political conquest mandate in addition to that. And so you can, just like you can deduce the existence of Jesus from the rapid spread of the early church, you can deduce the existence of Muhammad as a charismatic founder from the rapid spread of, uh, of, of Islam as a political entity. And so I consider, and all competent scholars I'm aware of, consider Muhammad's existence historically certain. And we, nevertheless, there are some people, like I mentioned Robert Spencer, who have questioned it. So we will have a future episode looking at that and the arguments that have been um, attempted unsuccessfully, I would, I would, I would, I would say, um, to cast doubt on Muhammad's existence. Our next question comes from Alex Silva, who writes, Jimmy, I'd love your thoughts about the book Heaven is for Real and Colton Burpus's near-death experience of heaven. So I haven't read the book, uh, but I may, and we may do an episode on it in the future. Based on the reports, it sounds like Colton uh, came back from his near-death experience, which is described in the book, with veridical information, meaning information that he didn't know at the time of the near-death experience, but that he learned in the afterlife and then was verified as being correct once he was revived. Uh, examples of that include he had his mother had had a miscarriage before he was born of a sister, and he came back from his near-death experience knowing about his miscarried unborn sister who he'd never been told about. He also came back with details of his long dead grandfather who he never met uh, because he died so long before his birth. Now, that vertical information would point to this being a real near-death experience. Of course, it depends on the reports in the book being true, and I haven't investigated them to this point. It also wouldn't mean that, uh, that everything he came back and reported was correct. People can misperceive things, they can misunderstand things, they can accidentally misreport things, especially, you know, if you're a child, you don't have a super big, super big vocabulary or cultural background to draw upon in understanding what you experience. So we'd want to be careful, even if this is a real experience, we'd want to be careful in interpreting it. We will have a link to where you can get some information on the book Heaven is for Real. And by the way, I want to mention that this is not the same book as another similar one, which is called The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven by Alex Malarkey. Um, The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven, you could confuse it with Heaven is for Real, because it also involves a young boy who had a near-death experience and came back, and then they wrote a book about his near-death experience. Um, The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven, though, is a different guy. And it's important to recognize that, because The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven is fabricated. And the boy himself admitted that. Basically, if I understand correctly, his father wanted to write a book about this and sort of pressured his son into talking about this near-death experience. And the boy who came back from heaven became really popular, especially in evangelical circles, 
but later the boy and his mother admitted this this was this was fabricated so um beware of the boy who came back from heaven but such charges have not so far as i'm aware been made regarding heaven is for real so heaven is for real is the more possible one and the boy who came back from heaven is an admitted hoax our next question is from andy fishherder who writes this is a follow-up question to your episode on giants. Jimmy said, and I've heard it said elsewhere, that humans can only get so big. My question is why? T-Rexes were 12 to 15 feet tall. Giraffes and other dinosaurs, not that a giraffe's a dinosaur, are taller than that, although mostly neck. I guess I'm wondering about the physics of height. Fantastic job on all the episodes. Keep up the great work and God bless. So there are several reasons why humans can only grow to a certain size. One of them has to do with gravity and the way um, it works on land animals. You'll notice we have things like whales in the sea, which are crazy big. Some of them are just crazy big. You don't see any land animals that big. And that's because in the sea, you have the buoyancy of water. So gravity doesn't hit you the way it does on land. But gravity hits you stronger if you're on land. You're not being buoyed up by water. And um, and that puts more stress on the systems in your body. That's why if a whale beaches, the whale is in real trouble because it's not designed to deal with gravity. It's designed to float. And um, and so it, a whale that's beached has all kinds of extra stress on its body and it can die from being beached. Um, well, so because humans are smaller, we we can survive better on land. You know, this, our bodies are not as big, so they're not as heavy, so not as much stress is put on things like our bones. And there's a limit to how human bones, how big human bones can grow. They're not, you know, a foot thick. We don't have, you know, arm bones or leg bones that are a foot thick that would enable us to stand 50 feet tall, despite the movie Attack of the 50-Foot Woman. Um, also, the human circulatory system is only designed to pump at a certain strength. So, you know, your heart has to shove blood all the way around your body and get it to every living cell in your body. And our hearts are only a certain size. They can only pump a certain amount and they won't pump blood effectively past a certain distance. If you want a fictional element of that, a depiction of that involving a giant human, uh, rather than watching Attack of the 50-Foot Woman, watch The Amazing Colossal Man, because it, it, deals it actually deals precisely with this issue. There's um, an astronaut named Glenn, if I recall correctly, who gets irradiated and he starts growing, but his heart isn't keeping up with the rest of his body. And so he begins to progressively suffer more effects because his heart can't effectively pump um, blood to other parts of his body, and he eventually goes crazy as a result, presumably, of oxygen deprivation to the brain, and he eventually would die if he kept growing and, and without his heart growing proportionally. But that's how humans work, and so the strength of our bones and our muscles, and especially our heart muscle, in being able to pump blood around the body is limited, and that's why we can't grow past a certain size. Other animals like giraffes and T. rexes are different. They have different body compositions. They have different muscle strengths. They have uh, different bones than we do. And so it is possible for other creatures to uh, take their basic framework and be bigger than us. But our framework is not designed to scale up that way. It's my understanding that uh, for a lot of people who grow like uh, extremely tall people. Yep often the cause of a shortened lifespan is that heart circulation issue, I guess, right? Heart, heart circulation. They can also suffer from brittle bones because of the stress on their bones that aren't scaled up right to handle that kind of load. Okay. Uh, our next question comes from Joseph Gosser, who writes, Hi, Jimmy and Dom. I have a friend who's recently become very concerned about an imminent polar shift disaster. I've never heard of this before, but would love to hear your thoughts. My assumption is that there may be some basis in reality, that there's some variance in the movement of the Earth, but on a scale that would cause a cataclysmic event, 
But it also made me curious that if there was an imminent danger, what could we do about it even anyway? Okay, I'm not sure where your friend encountered this idea. It may have been in New Age circles, because one of the things that Edgar Casey talked about, and we, we've discussed Edgar Casey before on the program, um, he gave some prophecies that in 1998, a pole shift was going to happen, and like the Earth is going to be knocked off its axis and change the way it rotates. Um, that didn't happen, which is really good because it would have killed everybody. Um, now, there is a difference, though, between a magnetic pole shift and a physical pole shift. A magnetic pole shift happens not when the Earth's physical axis of rotation changes, but when its magnetic field changes. And... Um, and we do see evidence in the geological record because we can measure, you know, the direction of magnetic fields at the time the rocks were formed. We can go through the geologic record and track the changes in the Earth's magnetic field. And what we find is that the Earth's magnetic poles have flipped in the past, where the magnetic North Pole becomes the magnetic South Pole and vice versa. Now, they're always, and this is caused by forces that are deep down in the earth, you know, that the, we've got an iron nickel core to the planet and its motions uh, generate our, the magnetic field that, for example, protects us from solar radiation. And every year, the magnetic poles drift a little bit and we can chart how, they, how they're drifting. They also vary in strength. And one of the things that has been found is before a pole flip, the uh, magnetic field tends to decrease and even like seemingly go to zero. And then when it comes back, the poles are different. So the alignment that used to be north-south is now south-north. Um, the thing is, okay, we have a little bit of evidence that we might at some point in the relatively soon geological time frame have a, a magnetic pole shift. Uh, the Earth's magnetic field has been decreasing a little bit, if I recall correctly, and so that could be a sign that maybe sometime in the next million years we're going to have a magnetic flip. But um, that's not really anything to worry about. Uh, there have been many magnetic flips, and life is still here. There weren't mass extinctions that were associated with these magnetic reversals. Uh, it would inconvenience our technology, but we just reprogram our technology so that north is south and south is north now. It wouldn't be a big deal in the long term. It would cause some temporary problems, but it's nothing, not a civilizational threatening disaster to worry about. So that's magnetic pole shifts. What about axial pole shifts, where the Earth physically shifts off its axis? Well, we don't have evidence of that happening on any kind of cyclical basis. So far as is known, there probably has only been one such event. And it happened way, way back in Earth's history, more than four billion years ago. Um, you may notice, you know, so if you look at other planets in the solar system, with the exception of, I believe it's Neptune, they all pretty much have axes that are perpendicular to the to the to the plane of the ecliptic. The ecliptic is the plane that the planets orbit the sun in. And if you draw a vertical line through the ecliptic, um, most of the planets have have rotational axes that are pretty close to that vertical line. There are a couple of exceptions. One of them, as I said, I believe is Neptune. The other is Earth. Earth has a, a rotational axis that is tilted 23 degrees off of, off of vertical from the ecliptic. And um, that's why we have seasons. That's why it's warm in the northern hemisphere in the, su in the summer months, you know, June, July, August. And it's cold in the, warm in the northern hemisphere in June, July, and August, and cold in the southern hemisphere in June, July, and August. So that's why we have white Christmases here in the northern hemisphere, and they have green Christmases in the southern hemisphere. It's because of that axial tilt. And Earth, with one other exception, is unique in having an axial tilt that big. So what caused it? Well, the theory is that originally Earth was quite a bit smaller, and then it was struck 
by another body that was about the size of Mars, and that collision ended up forming the present Earth-Moon system. So us down here on the planet Earth and our sister planet, the Moon, formed out of this collision between the, the, the proto-Earth and this Mars-sized body that's called Theia. And so it was the Theia impact that not only formed the Earth-Moon system, but also knocked the Earth 23 degrees off vertical. And so that appears to be the only axial pole shift of any note in Earth's history. And yeah, that would be very dangerous. If there was any life on Earth at that time, it was probably killed and had to come back in another form. Um, but there is no evidence of that happening. And Earth is huge. It weighs Gadzook's number of tons. And the first, the, the, Newton's first law of motion is inertia. Something's going to continue doing what it, what it does unless something interferes with it. And so Earth has all of this angular momentum causing it to turn around that 23 degree angle. And it's so massive that it would require a massive amount of force, like another Mars-sized impact, to change the Earth's, the Earth's rotational axis. And fortunately, we have good telescopes now. We can see all of the near-Earth bodies in the solar system. I mean, there are a few small ones we're still chasing down, but we don't. There are a few a asteroids that might hit us in and cause problems in the future, but nothing the size of Mars is heading our way. So we don't have to worry about an axial pole shift. And like you said, there's nothing we could do about it if it were to Oh, yeah. Happen. I was going to mention that. Yeah, we couldn't do anything anyway, so your friends shouldn't worry about it. No sense worrying about what you can't do anything about. We'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Sean M., Mark C., Catherine B., Dave T., and Victor C. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Great Lakes Customs Law, helping importers and individuals with seizures, penalties, and compliance with U.S. Customs Matters throughout the United States. Visit greatlakescustomslaw.com. And by... DeliverContacts.com, offering contact lenses at low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com. Our next question comes from Frank Rezek, who writes, Hi, Jimmy and Dom. I was wondering if you might discuss some of the history of lost languages. Why were they forgotten? What kinds of knowledge are lost to us because of it? What are some words that are still hanging around today? White what might the next lost language be? Thanks for your great work. I wait impatiently every week for the newest episodes. So the, in terms of the reasons that languages go extinct, there are a couple of them. One of them is the people who speak the language can go extinct. They can get killed off. They can have uh, civilizational disasters or societal disasters that result in the end of their society, whether it's you know, a famine or a plague or a war or whatever. Um, and if they if they if they die down to a certain level, there won't be enough people around who still speak that language to make it a viable ongoing thing, uh, because who's ever left is going to need to get along with other human beings. And, and those other human beings, by definition, would be members of a different language community if they weren't part of the original language community that's going extinct. And, um, and that leads to the second reason which that languages go extinct, which is conversion. Not religious conversion, but linguistic conversion. So you have people who are native speakers of one language, they come into contact with speakers of another language, and there are enough reasons and the reasons can vary, but there are enough reasons that it becomes advantageous to speak the new language, and they get used to that. And eventually, the new language becomes a home language. People's kids start knowing the new language better than they know me old man's lingo. 
And eventually um, it gets forgotten because people have converted from speaking one language to speaking a new language. And, you know, we see examples of that. If you, for example, were to go to Ireland today, there are people who still speak Irish Gaelic, but not near as many of them as there were a thousand years ago because of the uh, conquest of Ireland by Great Britain, which is predominantly English speaking. Um, it became advantageous for many Irish people to speak English. And eventually, the advantages of speaking English were enough that knowledge of Irish Gaelic has receded. And the same thing happened in Scotland, where you had Scottish Gaelic. But now most Scotsmen speak English rather than Scottish Gaelic, although they may know some of it. And the same phenomenon happens in other cultures uh, all throughout history. If you look at the history of the Bible, for example, well, originally the, the Israelites spoke Hebrew, and then they got conquered by the Babylonians, who, were, who used the international language Aramaic as a lingua franca to communicate between different cultures. And so Jewish people started speaking Aramaic as their home language. They may have still had some knowledge of Hebrew, particularly in the synagogue, but on a day-to-day -day basis by the first century in Palestine, they were primarily speaking Aramaic. And even part of the Old Testament, a small part, is written in Aramaic. And then after the Babylonians conquered everybody, the Macedonians conquered everybody, and they spoke Greek. In fact, they spoke several different varieties of Greek, like Attic Greek and Doric Greek. And they needed to be able to, under Alexander the Great, who led the invasion, the soldiers from different Greek groups needed to talk to each other. And that led a blending of these different Greek dialects into what's called Koine or Common Greek. And so Common Greek became a new lingua franca. It was used for commerce and government and things like that. Even the Romans who spoke Latin were speaking Greek a lot too for commerce and government. And that became common all over the Roman Empire. And so that's why some of the last books of the Old Testament, like Wisdom of Solomon, and all of the books of the New Testament were written in Greek, because Greek was supplanting Aramaic except on a local basis. So um, fortunately, Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek have all survived, but there are some languages that haven't, and we have some scripts, meaning writing systems, in some parts of the world that we don't know how to read. We don't exactly know what language is behind it. One of the most famous is from a um, is from what's known as the Indus Valley Civilization, which is, as you would guess, in the Indus Valley in India. And they left a writing system behind. We see their writing system on, you know, um, stone walls and things like that and artifacts that they left behind, but we haven't figured out how to read it. Um, so there's information there that is inaccessible to us. That information has been lost because even though we have their writing, we don't know how to read their writing at this point. There also are words that survive from lost languages. One of them is Etruscan. Uh, the Etruscans were a group of people who lived on the Italian peninsula. And um, before the rise of the Latins, you know, they had their own language and their own culture. And eventually the Latins gained, po gained political and social power and Rome began to dominate. And the Etruscan language was sub not entirely, but substantially forgotten. But we do still have uh, some words in Latin that we can tell are of Etruscan origin. And we know a few Etruscan, we know some Etruscan, but not the whole language. Um, in terms of what's been lost, most of the knowledge in the ancient world has been lost, but that's not because of languages being lost. It's because most of the knowledge in the ancient world was preserved orally, and we don't have people who know that anymore. It's been forgotten because of the limitations of human memory and the transmission of information across centuries in oral means. Um, also, in much of the world, uh, writing materials are non-permanent uh, because of, for example, the moisture level. The reason we find so much writing in ancient Egypt is because it's a desert, and the dry sands preserve writing materials 
like, um, you know, if you have a big trash heap containing ancient manuscripts, the papyrus and the parchment will survive in that dry, arid environment. But in most of the world, paper rots. And so it hasn't been the loss of the language that has cost us the knowledge. It's the fact that the writing materials decayed over time. And unfortunately, newer copies of them were not made, so we don't have a lot of ancient writings anymore. There are certain ancient writings I would love for us to have, especially uh, a five-volume work called Expositions of the Logia of the Lord by the late first and early second Greek writer Papias, who wrote basically, he interviewed eyewitnesses of Jesus's ministry and basically wrote what looks like a five-volume commentary on the Gospels. Man, I would love to have that. And it reportedly survived as late as the 1400s. It may still survive and be in a library somewhere and just hasn't been cataloged yet. I, that's my hope because I would, or maybe we'll find a copy of it in Egypt. I would love to have that. That would be awesome. But unfortunately, um, there is a lot of lost information, but primarily not because of the loss of languages. Languages are being, in terms of what's the next one that's going to be lost, I really couldn't tell you. The languages that get lost are the small ones that are spoken by only a handful of people. And there are bunches of those. There's like 6,000 languages or something like that right now in the world, most of which are spoken only by a tiny fraction of people, tiny number of people. And with the rise of a global culture with telecommunications in the major languages like English and Spanish and Chinese and Russian, it becomes more and more advantageous for the tiny number of speakers of these vanishing languages to convert and adopt one of the major languages so they can have commerce and intercourse, you know, business intercourse and communication with the larger language groups. So uh, there are efforts to preserve uh, languages that are fading, but it's a race against time. And one of the nice things is that uh, you can always, a lost language can be rediscovered like we did with the, um, the Rosetta Stone, where we didn't know, we thought e Egyptian was lost and right. that helped us find it again. So that's... It, but unfortunately, Rosetta Stones are hard to come by. We yeah, haven't they... got one for the Indus Valley civilization yet. <laughs> <laughs> Calling Indiana Jones. And yeah. our next uh, uh, patron question comes from Cyprian Casadaban. Casadaban? I'm sorry, Cyprian, you can tell me how it's pronounced uh, next time we encounter each other on Discord or Patreon. But uh, until then, hi, Jimmy and Dom. I have a mystery that I'm sure you can solve. Whatever happened to mysterious headlines? I really miss this segment. I understand that sometimes y'all record several weeks before submitting the show, but this segment is sorely missed. Maybe a special 30-minute Mysterious Headlines episode every once in a while? Thanks for all you do. Well, thank you, uh, Cyprian. I like doing Mysterious Headlines, too. L newer listeners to the show may not know what we're referring to, but um, in the early days of the show, we did have, at the end of the show, a segment called Mysterious Headlines. And I would share usually two or three headlines that had been recently in the news, often that were connected with the mystery I was investigating. Um, and I eventually had to stop doing it because it took time to, to find those stories and to sift through. Now, there are certain sources that I would read regularly, like I have a science feed that I read every day and see what's in it. And I would draw on that science feed for a lot of these. There are also certain mystery-related feeds that I would consult when looking for mysterious headlines. I don't necessarily, on my, without the headlines, I mean, I don't necessarily read them every day, but I would check there. And it just took time. And as the scripts became longer and more complex and we started to do bigger mysteries and cover them in more depth, the research needs for the main part of the show became greater. And I just didn't have the time to, uh, to, to, to do the, um, the research needed for the mysterious headlines. And so we ended up dropping that. The same thing basically happened to Mysterious Feedback, where in the, if you go back and listen to early shows, we'd have feedback at the end of every episode from a recent episode. But it, with me being the researcher writer for all of this, it, it, it just became prohibitively difficult for me to do that. And so what we did was we asked for a volunteer 
to be our feedback coordinator. And Rob Leonardi very kindly volunteered for that. And so now he collects the feedback. And rather than trying to sequence it at the end of every show, because the shows get have gotten longer, and I don't want to make them longer still, uh, we occasionally do a bonus episode that is all mysterious feedback. I don't know that I would want to do episodes that are all mysterious headlines, but I could see a return of mysterious headlines as just little brief things like two or three links that we mention at the end of every show if we had a mysterious headlines coordinator. So if anyone is interested in doing that, I can explain the process of how I would gather the headlines and what kind of headlines are appropriate and the the headline coordinator could, you know, draft a list of Uh, of headlines for me to choose from, and then I could select the ones that I think would, you know, work best. And we could potentially restore that segment of the show, but it would require, it would require someone who was interested in doing the work. And, you know, we couldn't pay anything for that. But as part of doing the work, you'd get exposed to a lot of interesting, mysterious stories, whether they end up on the show or not. And uh, you would also qualify for a Mysterious Irregulars shirt, which is yes. a, an exclusive just for folks who help us out uh, in ways like that and volunteer for the show. So uh, it would be very, very nice. If you'd like to volunteer, just send an email to the feedback at mysterious.fm uh, email address. Our next bit of uh, patron question comes from Ian Wilson, who writes, Hello, Jimmy and Dom. I'm a historian working on my dissertation, so my question is about my research. While I know you've spoken on certain types of alternative healing practices before, I wanted to get a little more information. I know that supernatural prognostication is out the window to Christians, no fortune telling, etc. My question is about Andrew Jackson Davis, the 19th century leader of a new religious movement. He lectured on a variety of topics, including predictions, science, religion, politics, and economics. Some of these lectures were supposedly received by spirits from the next life. However, he also worked as a clairvoyant healer. He claimed to see through people via clairvoyance and diagnose them with whatever ailed them. Then he prescribed a variety of remedies. Largely, these diagnoses were not communicated to him via spirits. Would it be permissible for a Catholic to attend his healing practices if they avoided his prognostication? And depending on your answer, I'm curious about other insyncretic healing practices like Limpia in South America. Thanks, Ian. Okay, so first of all, good luck with your dissertation. That's awesome that you're uh, you're pursuing a doctorate in history. Um, one thing I would say is prognostication is not forbidden to Christians. There are certain methods of trying to learn about the future that are not appropriate for Christians, but as the Catechism points out, God can reveal the future to his prophets, and to saints. So there are people who get supernatural information from God or from angels that can tell us what's going to happen in the future, like what happened in the Fatima apparitions that we've talked about on the show before. They correctly predicted the assassination attempt on John Paul II decades later, and also a nuclear war that could be and was averted by consecrating Russia to the Immaculate Heart. In addition, to supernatural knowledge of the future, there's also preternatural knowledge of the future, which would be obtained by psychic means. And as we talked about, for example, in episode 105 and 106 on Aquinas and the Occult, um, Christian thinkers, including doctors of the church like St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas, believed in what we would today classify as psychic powers, including precognition. Now, Aquinas would explain them in ways consistent with the Aristotelian science of his day. We wouldn't explain them that way today. But he believed that humans could, by human nature, receive... So this is a psychic power. It's not, coming, it's not supernatural. It's natural to humans. Um, he believed humans could naturally receive impressions of what's going to happen in the future. And that was, among other things, his explanation for precognitive dreams that people have. Um, and uh, he referred to it didn't, didn't have to happen in dreams, but it often does. And modern parapsychological research has, has confirmed that. In fact, um, Louisa Rhine did a study of 
different kinds of spontaneous psychic experiences, and she found that of precognitive experiences, 60% of them involved realistic dreams, whereas when it came to telepathic and clairvoyant experiences, only 19% of them uh, involved, pre in, involved realistic dreams. So there's a much higher percentage of precognitive experiences that involve realistic dreaming. Um, but it can happen in other circumstances. And Aquinas referred to this. He didn't call it precognition because that word is of modern origin. Um, it began in, in after the birth of modern parapsychology. But uh, Aquinas called it natural prophecy to distinguish it from the supernatural prophecy that God gives. And there are some similarities and differences between natural and supernatural prophecy. Um, you can go back and listen to episode 105 and 106. on a, It's especially the latter episode where we talk about Aquinas' views on that. But you can check that out. We will have a future episode on Andrew Jackson Davis. Uh, I am familiar with him. Uh, we'll also have a link for people who are not familiar with him to learn more about Andrew Jackson Davis. Um, I haven't done a careful analysis of his work. I mean, I'm familiar with it in general terms, but I haven't done a careful analysis of his work. If he's diagnosing or healing people, unless you've got evidence that he's doing it by demons, it would not be, in, and you have to have actual evidence. You can't just leap to the demon hypothesis because the ability to heal people would be a form of psychokinesis, which happens to be another psychic ability that Aquinas believed in. It was his explanation for why the evil eye could harm people. And so he also believed in psychokinesis. And we have good evidence today of psychokinesis happening, including, um, dis including influence on living systems like healing. And so if Andrew Jackson Davis was doing something that was purely natural, it wouldn't be in, in principle wrong to use it. On the other hand, that doesn't mean there are no danger signals here. And not having done a careful study of Andrew Jackson Davis yet, I can't comment in a general way on what he did. I can only note the principles that would be applied in, in considering a case like his. When it comes to um, other healing practices, like you mentioned, the South American practice, Limpia. I know a little bit about it. You know, it, it's essentially a form of folk healing and includes emotional healing, but I haven't studied it yet. I would note that that there can be genuine therapeutic effects that are from folk medicine that can be legitimate. Um, that's how we got aspirin. Aspirin is essentially a real compound we developed that's similar to a compound found in willow bark. And so before the development of aspirin, people would take willow bark to deal with, you know, things like headaches. And you, it's still legitimate to take willow bark now, even though it originated in folk medicine. Um, but we also now have aspirin. And so, again, like anything else, you got to use critical thinking to sort the good from the bad, and we shouldn't dismiss everything in a field just because it has some problematic elements. You have to sort the good from the bad. John Setnar asks, Hey, Jimmy and Dom, I was wondering if you would have an opinion on the thesis and work of Graham Hancock, author of Fingerprints of the Gods, and more recently, Magicians of the Gods. A related documentary on Amazon Prime is Builders of Ancient Monuments. Are you going to eventually cover this topic in an episode of Mysterious World? Yeah, we, we may indeed uh, cover Graham Hancock and his archaeological theories in a future episode. He's regarded by most um, scholars as, well, the great majority of scholars as being a, a pseudo-archaeologist. He's, he's promoting ideas that the great majority of the archaeological community believes do not correspond to the actual archaeological evidence. And while I haven't researched him in depth yet, thus far I have not been impressed with what I've seen from him. He may have some good ideas, but a lot of his claims about ancient, more advanced civilizations um, and specific claims about, you know, the development of things in Egypt do not appear to be supported by the evidence. But, uh, you know, I, in the future, I can do further research on him and 
um, apply critical thinking and see about sorting the good from the bad. In the meantime, for people who are not familiar with Graham Hancock, we'll have a link to information about him so you can check him out. And I believe there's some uh, discussion of the criticisms of his work there so you can get some information on both about what he claims and what some of the criticisms of it are. All right. Our next question comes from Melanie, who asks, who is the beloved disciple in John's gospel? I recently came across an article, not recently published, but new to me, that argues that Lazarus is the beloved disciple. And I'd like to hear Jimmy's take on it. So the author of John's gospel deliberately keeps his identity secret, he uh, unmentioned. Now, the audience, he expected the audience to know who he is. but uh, be, And we can tell that because at the end, he rec- in John 21, he recounts this story where, um, you know, he and Jesus and Peter were talking and Jesus, Peter told, Jesus told Peter, follow me with the implication, meaning you're eventually going to die. And Jesus tells him he's going to die. Um, <clears throat> but Peter then sees the beloved disciple and says, well, what about this guy? And Jesus says, if, if I want him to remain until I come back, what is that to you? You know, focus on your own task. And that led some in the early Christian community to believe that the beloved disciple would never die. And the beloved disciple mentions this rumor and says, but that's not what Jesus said. He didn't say, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to die. He said, Jesus said, what if I wanted him not to die before I come back? And so he's debunking this rumor about himself. So obviously he expects the audience to know who he is. You know, there aren't going to be that many eyewitness disciples of Jesus who Jesus would have said this about. Not everybody's going to have this rumor about them. So he, his identity was known to the audience, but in literary terms, he does something very interesting. He, intru- he introduces himself in stages that become more explicit as we go through the gospel. His first appearance seems to be in John chapter 2, where we have um, a... Um, where we have a couple of disciples of John the Baptist meeting Jesus. And one of the disciples, we're told, is Andrew. But the other, we're not told who it is. But there is a common practice in the ancient world. In, scholarly, in the scholarly community, it's called an inclusio, meaning an inclusion. And it frequently involves uh, mentioning someone right at the front of a text and then also at the end of a text or section of text. And the material in between those two mentions is material that is based on what that individual says. So it's like the, in, the individual mentioned in the inclusio at the beginning and the end is the one who's responsible for all the stuff in the middle. And so this is one way of, if John sig- explicitly signals himself as the author at the end, and it looks like that unnamed disciple in, along with Andrew is a, is a reference to himself at the beginning, saying, I'm the one responsible for all of this. I'm the witness to this material. And then as he mentions himself sporadically through the text, we get more and more information about him. Like we learn, he's the one who was laying closest to Jesus at the Last Supper, and he knew the high priest personally, and so forth. But he never says who he is. And so even though the audience knew it, it leaves us in a bit of a quandary, and people have tried to deduce who it is. The m- most popular theory, at least in much of church history, is that he's John, son of Zebedee. But there are some problems with that. Um, John, son of Zebedee, was a Galilean fisherman. Why would he personally know the elite high priest in Jerusalem? You know, that's not really plausible that a backwoods fisherman who is described in, um, in uh, the book of Acts as being an illiterate. I mean, it says that Peter and John were agramatoi, unlettered. They, they, at a minimum, that means they were not educated, but it literal, taking it literally, it means they couldn't read, at least at this station. They would have staged in their lives. They would have had to have other people read to them and thus also write on their behalf. They would have used scribes, which everybody did if you were an author back then. 
Um, it's very unlikely that an uneducated backwoods fisherman is going to know the pinnacle of Jewish society personally, the Jewish high priest. It's obvious the disciple had been over to the high priest's house multiple times because the maid knows the beloved disciple, the doorkeeper maid knows who the beloved disciple and lets him in, but does not let Peter out, uh, does not let Peter in until the beloved disciple intercedes for Peter. So he's someone who hangs out and the beloved disciple doesn't look like he's from Galilee. He looks like he's someone who lives in the Jerusalem area and is personally part of the elite and is known to the high priest, goes over to the high priest's house all the time and is let in by the high priest's staff because they recognize him. None of that sounds like what you'd expect of a Galilean fisherman. Also, if you study the appearances of the beloved disciple in the Gospel of John, they're in and around Jerusalem. They're, John's Gospel spends very little time in Galilee. Um, it's centered around Jerusalem, and that would be consistent with the idea of the beloved disciple being a member of the Jerusalem elite. It would also explain why he's able to write and be an author of a gospel with actually pretty good Greek. Um, so, could that be Lazarus? Well, um, this has been proposed. This is one of the theories, and there's at least a little bit of a basis for it. Because in John chapter 11, where we encounter the raising of Lazarus, G it, Jesus weeps at Lazarus's tomb before he raises him. And the people who are witnessing this comment on see how he loved him. So they're remarking on how Jesus loved Lazarus. And that's consistent with these other references to the author of the gospel as the disciple Jesus loved. So, Lazarus is not an impossible theory for who the beloved disciple is. But there are two problems. There are three problems with it. First problem, um, the beloved disciple is clearly doing a very intricate thing with his identity in the gospel. He does not reveal, he never names himself, and he, um, he never comes out and says, and I so-and-so did this. He, he deliberately refers to him in uh, using the term the beloved disciple, and he only reveals that he's the author at the very end. So, if he displays this pattern, even after chapter 11, he's avoiding his name and never uses it in any of the chapters after chapter 11, why would he suddenly drop his name in chapter 11? You know, I mean, Jesus could love more than one person. Jesus did love more than one person. Jesus loved everybody in some sense, but he, you know, loved some people. He was close to some people more than others. And so why would the beloved disciple drop his name in chapter 11 and then reel it back and not use it after that, you know, in, in the passages where he discusses himself? Um, so that's one problem. Another problem is um, if you compare the accounts of Jesus's anointing in the different Gospels, particularly Matthew, Mark, and John, um, you find that you find that the anointing occurs in Mark 14 in the house of Simon the leper. But the anointing in John occurs with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So it would sound like the, that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were the children of Simon the leper. And that could also explain why none of these three individuals are mentioned as being married. You know, especially adult women you would expect Mary and Martha to have husbands, and they would be known by their husband's name. It would be, you know, um, Mary, the wife of Aristion, and uh, Martha, the wife of Dosithius, or things like that. And you'd also have a mention that they're the sisters of Lazarus, but they're not. And so it looks like they're unmarried. And the same thing may be true of Lazarus, although it, would be, it wouldn't be necessary that his wife would be mentioned. But if he was married, 
why isn't she mentioned in, in the account of his raising? You know, why isn't she there at the tomb weeping? Why isn't, uh, why isn't there news of her beloved husband being restored to her by Jesus's efforts, just like the widow of Nain is, has her son restored to her by Jesus's efforts? So it looks like Lazarus isn't married either. And if these three people were the kids of a leper, that would explain why they didn't have a lot of marriage offers. They might even have leprosy themselves, although that's not mentioned in the text, but even being the son of a leper would diminish their marital prospects in ancient Hebrew society. And so, so supposing that to be the case, would, if, if Lazarus was a leper or the son of a leper, is he going to be admitted to the, high, to the household of the high priest who has to remain ritually pure at all times? Is he really going to be coming in regular contact with someone who's from a contaminated household that's going to make him ritually impure and be in such frequent contact that the staff knows who, who this person is and just lets him in without any? So have you had any leprosy outbreaks lately? That's a problem for the Lazarus theory. Final problem I mention is, why is this known as the Gospel of John? How did, how did Lazarus's name get off of it and John's name get onto it, which happened early? I think the better evidence is that it was written by someone named John, not John, son of Zebedee, but a different John. And there are multiple Johns in the New Testament alone. John was an extremely common name. My theory, which is shared by, some, by a variety of scholars and was even partially endorsed by Pope Benedict, um, is that the author of John's Gospel is a man named John, who was a member of the Jerusalem elite. He's sometimes called John of Jerusalem. He's also sometimes called John the Theologian. And he is very likely referred to in early Christian literature as John the Presbyter, or John the Elder, um, who is mentioned as a second John distinct from John, son of Zebedee, and various authors, including St. Jerome, attributed some of the Joannine literature, like 2nd and 3rd John, to John the Elder, not John the Presbyter. So I think it's, on that theory, if, if it was written by John the Presbyter, it's very easy to see how that could get confused with Jesus' disciple, John, son of Zebedee. They're both named John. They're both eyewitnesses of Jesus' ministry. They're both very close to Jesus. And people eventually forgot the distinction between them and thought, oh, it must be the John in question must be the son of Zebedee because he was one of the core disciples. So I think that that's the most likely theory. But I believe in letting people consider both sides. So we'll have an article, a link to an article from an evangelical scholar named Ben Witherington, who I've talked to in the past. He was nice to me. Um, and he is an advocate of the Lazarus hypothesis. So you can. Check that out. And now someone needs to write a science fiction novel or political thriller called The Lazarus Hypothesis. <laughs> there has been books or, or things, science fiction things with Lazarus in the title. I do know that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the next one comes from Adam Gonzalez, who writes, Hi, Jimmy and Dom. My 14-year-old son is a question. If he had a time machine and was able to go to all of the Sunday masses and Holy Days of Obligation for the upcoming year within a month and a half, two masses a day. Could he take the rest of the year off from going to mass? He could if he used the time machine to skip over Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. Because the way the law is written, you have to go, if you're, if, if you're in a particular period of time, and it's a Sunday or a Holy Day of Obligation, you got to go to mass either on the Sunday or the evening preceding. So you could serially go through a year and hit all of the Sundays and Holy Days of Obligations and get your Masses out of the way, and then go back through that year, but you'd have to skip over the Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation, because if you are in one of those Sundays a second time, then um, it, it, you would seem to, the way at least the way the law is written, you would seem to know, need to go to Mass. All right. Uh, very straightforward. So uh, next question comes from David Brucker. Was Jesus's resurrection a necessary event for our salvation? That is, what if he had gone straight to heaven and not walked the earth? Would it have the same effect? 
Further, what is the impact if he had waited until the final judgment to unite his body and soul like the rest of us? Before I answer that, I want to go back and qualify my answer to the previous question. I think it would be arguable that you might not have to skip over the Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation, because if I've already gone, if I've already, let's say it's December 25th, and so that's Holy Day of Obligation, I go to Mass, and I'm still in December 25th, I don't have to go to Mass a second time. And so one could say, well, it's just, even if you don't, it, so let's say you do the get everything out of the way view, you go to Mass on December 25th, then you go back to the beginning of the year, go through it again, and you come up to December 25th again. I think legally it would be arguable, I've already been to Mass on this December 25th. So just like I don't have to go to Mass twice in the same day, I'm in the same day, so, uh, so I don't have to go to Mass a second time. Jimmy, it's, just to... It, to... Mm -hmm. To add to that, sorry, if even in something that's not involved time travel, if I went back across the international date line, mm -hmm. and if I've already done December 25th and then go back across it on December 26th to back to December 25th again, I wouldn't have to go to mass again, right? Similar? I think that would be similar, um, but I'd, I'd want to think about that more. So okay. thank you for springing unsuspected <laughs> scenarios on me while I'm answering You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, that's good reasoning. I mean, that's, that's a useful situation that could help us tease out the legal principle here. So I think it's arguable. Um, I think you could probably argue it both ways. I'd have to do more thinking in order to develop a settled opinion. So... To get to David's question, uh, was Jesus' resurrection necessary for our salvation? What if he had gone straight to heaven and not walked the earth so he would die and then just go to heaven? Would it have the same effect? Further, what is the impact if he had waited until the final judgment to, re to unite his body and soul like the rest of us do? Well, the answers are going to be, it depends on how God chose to set things up. God could have redeemed us without Jesus going to the cross as well, at all. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas points out that the means of our redemption is entirely up to God. He's omnipotent. He can do it any way he chooses. He could just snap his fingers and say, you're all redeemed. So it, the answer will really depend on how God set the rules up and you know, which ones he chose to put in place. And that's something we have only limited knowledge of. We don't know all of the reasons why God chose to do it the way he did or, ex or what all the rules exactly were. We know that by doing it this way, God redeemed us, but we don't know what the limits of that are or what else he, you know, what hidden qualifiers there are in there. We do have at least some indication that Jesus's resurrection was directly involved in our redemption. In Romans 4.25, Paul says that Jesus was raised for our justification. And you could take that different ways, but if Paul means that literally, that would mean Jesus needed to be raised, or Jesus' resurrection at least did result in our justification. And so you could say, well, maybe we wouldn't have been justified, or at least not justified until the end of the world, when Jesus got raised like everybody else. Um, so that suggests that in our timeline, the resurrection was directly involved in our salvation. It might be different in another timeline, and if Jesus was not raised until the last day, like the rest of us, then it would have taken a longer period for our redemption to be accomplished, but that wouldn't mean it wasn't accomplished. It would have just taken longer. All right, and then our next question comes from Mike M., who writes, Was Mary Surratt wrongly convicted of being a co-conspirator of the Lincoln assassination? There doesn't seem to be much evidence, especially considering her eventual punishment. Howdy, this is future Jimmy, and I'm visiting you here in the past. I've just uh, time-traveled to let you know something. In the following answer, you're going to hear me accidentally have a slip of the tongue. I'm at a couple of points I mentioned L President Lincoln's successor, and I accidentally say President Andrew Jackson. The actual... Uh, Successor of Lincoln is President Andrew Johnson. President Andrew Jackson was an earlier president, but it was President Andrew Johnson that was Lincoln's successor. So 
No need to point that out. I realized it after we did the recording, and I just wanted to let you know. Thanks so much. Now here's the answer. Yeah, so for people who may not be aware, Mary Surratt was the owner of a boarding house where John Wilkes Booth's conspiracy met. And the question is whether she was part of the conspiracy or not. Maybe she was just the boarding house owner and didn't even necessarily know what her sons and John Wilkes Booth and others were planning. Um, there certainly has been criticism of, of, of what she did, saying the evidence in her case was thin. Also, she was like the first woman ever executed in American history, and there were critics at the time, even some who thought she was guilty, who said we shouldn't be executing her. Um, and there were appeals uh, that were presented to President Andrew Jackson to uh, give clemency in her case and commute her sentence. And he apparently, now he later said he didn't do this. He said he never saw the appeals, but other people said, oh no, he saw the appeals. He orally in front of me refused to sign the appeals and said she was the viper that hatched the, that kept the nest where the conspiracy was hatched. And so um, there are different, different accounts um, of exactly what President Jackson did. Having said that, uh, we will be covering uh, the John Wilkes Booth anti-Lincoln conspiracy and possibly other anti-Lincoln conspiracies because there were several in future episodes. I haven't, it's been a long time since I looked closely at the Booth conspiracy. And I, so um, I need to do further research uh, into the Mary Surratt case and the case against her. And as I do that research, I'll be able to develop more of a definite opinion about Mary Surratt. Uh, right now, I don't have a settled opinion. You know, I try, as people know on the show, not to have settled opinions before I've researched something, although I may give my suspicions. Uh, and I understand that there are reasons why some have questioned whether Mary Surratt was actually involved in the conspiracy and whether she should have been executed. But we'll go into that in more detail in the future. And for now, we'll have a link to where you can read more about Mary Surratt and her execution. Our next question comes from Katarzyna Zasada, who writes... Cool, cool name. Yes, very nice. I'm an evangelical Christian now, but I was raised in a traditional Catholic household and was very, very devout. So I still retain an interest in the church. I would really love to hear your perspective on St. Januarius. Is it really his blood? If it isn't, what could it be? Well, I've done some preliminary research on the blood of St. January. It's not a lot, but some. And it, it seems it really does liquefy at certain times. Um, the question is, what is responsible for that liquefaction or liquefaction? Could it have a natural cause or could it have or, or does it have to have a supernatural cause? Um, that I have not yet done the research to determine, you know, if, if, and it may not be possible to determine because there are limitations on what scientists are allowed to do. There have been scientific studies of the vials in which St. Januarius's blood is contained, but the church authorities have not given permission to open the vials because they're afraid that um, doing so could disturb the blood and, you know, like by exposing it to environmental factors that might harm it. And per, like if it got mo extra moisture or something in there, it might always stay liquid and not do the transition or it might gum up the works and prevent it from liquefying, depending on the level of moisture that got in. So they've required the scientists to study the vials through the glass. And you can do a significant amount through the glass. You can, you can, you know, use a microscope, you can do um, spectroscopy, um, but you can't do as much as you could if you could open the vials. So I don't know if it's possible to determine the exact cause of the liquefaction of St. Januarius's blood, but we may do an episode on this in the future, and we'll have a link for people who would like to read about it to information about St. Januarius. And also, you may want to check out episode 220 that we did on Eucharistic miracles. It doesn't cover St. Januarius's blood, but it does cover similar blood and tissue-like miraculous phenomena. So I'd suggest that to you, and thank you very much, Katarzyna, 
uh, for your support and to all the patrons for their support. Uh, happy to help out with the questions and glad that you enjoy the show and always happy to hear from y'all. We hope you've enjoyed this patrons question show. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is only p- possible because of the generosity of our patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to support Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and have your questions answered on a future show for patrons, go to sqpn.com slash give. And as like said before, you can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 274. So that's it from us. We'd love to hear your theories about any of the patron questions that Jimmy answered. You can do that by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page, sending an email to feedback at mysterious.fm, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, in the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or by calling our mysterious feedback line 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. 4515. And I want to say a special word of thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work they do on Mysterious World. They do video, animation, and design work. So if you have a need for those things, check them out. Go to their website. You can also see examples of their work by looking at Mysterious World episodes at my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. And if you're an audio listener of the program, I'd really encourage you to go there because I think the video adds a lot, including special things that we do to help, you know, graphics and things to help communicate ideas better. Um, While you're at my YouTube channel, I would appreciate it if you hit the like button and comment, because if YouTube sees you liking and commenting, then they think that you like the episode and it will generate engagement. And so they'll show it to other people, too. And you can help us grow the audience by doing that. Also, I'm trying to grow my channel. And we recently passed 40,000 subscribers. We're working our way towards 50 now. That's the new goal. So I'd appreciate it if you uh, subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you always get notified whenever I have a new video up, whether it's a Mysterious World video or one of the apologetic videos I do. So, Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Next week, we're going to be taking, begin taking a two-part look at modern reincarnation research. We first discussed reincarnation back in episode 93, and again in episode 94, and we focused on the famous Brighty Murphy case, precisely because it's historically the best-known case here in America. However, many listeners wanted to hear what I'd have to say about modern reincarnation research, and I promised we'd eventually do episodes on that, so that's what we're going to do next. Next week, we'll be summarizing what competent parapsychologists have found in studying what are known as cases of the reincarnation type. And we'll hear some very interesting stories. Then, the following week, we'll look at what could explain these cases from the perspectives of faith and reason. And I'll be telling you a theory that I'd like to propose, which is one that isn't currently out there in the parapsychological literature. It's a new theory, and you won't want to miss that. Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Rosary Army, featuring award-winning Catholic podcasts, rosary resources, videos, and the School of Mary online community, prayer, and learning platform. Learn how to make them, pray them, and give them away while growing in your faith at rosaryarmy.com and schoolofmary.com. Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Tim Shevlin's personal fitness training for Catholics, providing spiritual and physical wellness programs and daily accountability check-ins. Strengthen yourself to help further God's kingdom. Work out for the right reason with the right mindset. Learn more by visiting fitcatholics.com. Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by The Grady Group, a Catholic company bringing financial clarity to their clients across the United States, using safe money options to produce reasonable rates of return for their clients. Learn more at GradyGroupInc.com. Excellent. Be looking forward to that. So until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest.